Okay. Um, so I do feel really lucky to be here and sharing. Um, uh, I'm from Perth, and so getting to fly over and be back in Melbourne, it's good. Um, I'm, as, as was just said, I work at CultureAmp, but this story isn't about CultureAmp. This is the story about the last job I had, um, which I left in September. Uh, and it's about the story of things that are a little bit harder than you realized when you first jumped in. Have you ever seen an opportunity that looked like it would be a really great opportunity, only to discover that the reality didn't quite match? It happens in all areas of life. Um, sometimes things just don't live up to how good they look on the outside. Um, and this was the case in 2016, where I'd just had a startup that had kind of fallen over, and I needed a job, and I wanted to work in the ed tech industry. So I was looking for places that work with schools. And so I started meeting with this startup. It was only five people, uh, but they had a really innovative product, some great design. I was really impressed by what they were trying to do. Uh, and so I wanted to join. Uh, they interviewed me really quick. They made an offer. They moved fast, and I was impressed. Uh, and I thought I was joining their front-end team, um, but it wasn't until after I joined I found out that the one front-end developer had just left. I wasn't joining the front-end team, I was the front-end team. Um, someone had just left and left behind 50,000 lines of spaghetti code. I'm sure some of you can relate. Uh, so I went through this stage where I'd started with like, oh my gosh, this product is amazing. Uh, and then I went through the stages of tech debt denial. So it starts with big love, hard eyes. This product is fantastic. And then you start to explore the code base. You open it in your editor and you're like, oh, I, there's more files here than I realized. It just keeps on going. And then you start to try and fix a bug but you're not really sure where the code comes from or why it's even being called. And after a while, you're pretty sure you fixed the bug, but you ship it and you broke other things. Uh, and you begin to get worried, and you're, you, you're like, I've seen this before. This is called technical debt. I'm going to refactor it. But there's no tests. And I try to change just the button style, but oh my gosh. It's, it's bad, there's no tests, no type checking, no linting, and then the final stage, acceptance. <laughs> Not really. Uh, we didn't accept it. Me and my fellow developer, Stephen, we were determined to turn this ship around. Uh, and so this is a short talk, I can't cover everything we did, but I'm going to just try and give some examples of the sort of things that you come across in a spaghetti code base and how you can begin to untangle them. Uh, and the first one is bad names. I'm not talking about names like John Smith or Northwest. Uh, I'm talking about naming variables and naming classes and functions. They say programming, it's one of the hard things, is how to name things. So we're a product for schools. And so our data, our domain model, we had schools. And in schools, you've got a bunch of classes. And in classes, you've got a bunch of students. And each student would have different lessons. And so the thing about our product was different students had different lessons, which was differentiated and really cool. That's what I loved. Um, but how do you think we named these things in our code base? Uh, first of all, we didn't just have students. We also had teachers. And maybe one day we'd have parents. So we'd call them users. I guess that makes sense. Uh, then we went. We, we can't call stuff a class, because our back end was in PHP and our front end was in JavaScript, and the word class is reserved in both of those. So what do you call it? Well, I guess it's a group. Uh, it's a group of students. Uh, and then lessons. Well, some teachers, they might be creating assessments as well as lessons. And there's formation, and there's education, and they're different. And let's just go with something generic. We'll call them modules. And then schools. We were mostly schools, but we had some like professional training organizations. And let's just call it tenants. Uh, except I don't know how to spell tenants, so we'll spell it wrong. Um, <laughs> I kid you not, that was the name of it in our database table. Uh, and that led to errors like this, where you say undefined variable tenant because it was expecting the double N. Um, so all that happens. And then the question is, you go to build a new feature, like a feature where you could split the students in your class into groups. What do you call a group of students when the word group is taken? Uh, we came up with the word division. It was pretty awful. You can see how 
the names that people who use the product were using were not the names we were using. And so when you get a bug report come in, or when you're trying to think about the code, it just gets confusing. You're always doing this mental translation in your head, and it's a sign of spaghetti code. Like, if you had a function like that, group.addStudent, and you're adding a student to the group, is it adding it to the group within the class or to the class? I'd have no idea without knowing what that variable was. And without type checking, you just don't know. Uh, and then to make it worse, we also had good old object-oriented thinking where you just add jargon, I guess. Um, I don't know if any of you have seen this comic. My friend Stephen that I was working with sent it to me one day and was like, let's rename things. You know, it's not a picture, it's a living space separation decoration. It's not a couch, it's a multi-butt separator. Um, so, how do you untangle this? Just avoid jargon in your names, use the same names, uh, same language in your code as you would in your product, it makes communication much easier. And if you're worried about renaming things and breaking things, use something like TypeScript or Flow to give you warnings. Uh, so that's, that's one thing. The next part was scope soup. Has anyone here been an Angular developer? You might have heard this term. Scope soup is one of the things that made Angular really hard. You'd have code like this. Sorry if that's a bit small to be able to see. It's just some HTML that takes a user object and a company object. But the problem was in Angular, you didn't know where the user object and company object were coming from. They might have been passed directly into this component, or they might have come from the component above it, the one above that, or from the very top of the page. They could have come from anywhere. And so you're like, oh, this user object has a problem in it. Where did it come from? I've got no idea. Uh, and you go look at the code that's there, and there's, there's no hints. And so the fix there in Angular world is to actually isolate your scopes and say, you're not allowed to touch anything that's global. Instead, you can only touch stuff that is explicitly passed in called company or called user. That makes it much easier. Um, then, uh, so you do that. The, if you're using React, this is just kind of built into the prop type. So if you're using something like Flow or TypeScript, uh, you'll be used to this. But avoiding global scope is really important. One of the things you might notice is this also happens with CSS. Up here, we've got user-card and user-name as CSS classes. We might be using those classes in a style sheet for this section of the code base, but there might be a user-name class somewhere else in the code base, and it gets really messy. So how do you untangle co uh, scope soup? Use explicit imports and modules, and I guess I should say prop types there as well. Make it really clear that this component expects these things, and it can't touch anything outside of that. And so you can just look at your file and know exactly where each variable is coming from. Uh, if you're using CSS, I really encourage you to either use JS in CSS or CSS modules where you get proper isolation and where you're not leaking stuff everywhere. But if not that, a naming convention like BEM is good. And finally, Angular 1 was notorious for scope soup. If you're still using it, you've got to start replacing it. Um, you do it one box at a time. You don't just rip it all out and replace it at, all at once. Whether you're migrating to newer versions of Angular or to React or to Vue or whatever, just replace one square at a time and move on. So the next thing we had was abstract abstractions. I'm sure some of you would have seen stuff like this. Um, model is what holds, it's like the state of your application. View is what the user sees. And a controller, uh, yeah, you have a controller. Um, <laughs> Then other people argue that that's no good. What you really want is a model view, view model controller. Um, and so we started getting files called you know, user view model, uh, .js, and that's one thing. If you're used to Angular, you might have seen some of this stuff, directives, and then they were like, nah, directives are no good. Go for components. Uh, and then they've got templates and providers and de dependency injection and all this kind of stuff. If you've come from Java world, maybe you've accidentally created a factory factory controller. Uh, and then you were kind of embarrassed to commit that to code, so you just renamed it to a provider factory controller <laughs> and hope no one notices. We didn't actually have that in our code base, but one we did have that I didn't understand was data strategies. I still have no idea what they were. Um, here's some code from something that was a data strategy. Uh, and as you can see, it pulls in a social service, and then the get activity discussion comments uh, calls the social service to do exactly that. Save activity discussion comment 
calls the social service to do exactly that. And update activity discussion comment calls the social service to do exactly that. Uh, this abstraction wasn't actually helping anyone. It was just a layer of indirection, and you'd go, ah, oh, I need to follow up the chain. I'm trying to figure out what's happening. And you'd have this file sitting in the middle of your stack trace being absolutely useless. Uh, and so we just worked and chipped away at refactoring these one piece at a time. And the commit message where we finally got rid of them looked something like that. Um, so boom, we were happy to see it go. Um, if you're wondering what kind of architecture is good, I really encourage you, uh, Kevin and Sebastian have been running the Elm workshop out there. The Elm architecture is, in my mind, the one architecture you need for writing front ends. Whether you're writing it in React, Redux uses the same thing. Uh, at this company, we switched to MobX, which, and we did it in the same way. But you have a model, which is the state of your page. So for us, that might have been the name of the class, the list of the students, and all of the, like, assessments and lessons that the students had lined up. Uh, then you had an update function or a way to trigger an action that would update the state of the page. And then you have your view, which renders your state into HTML. This is the way React is designed to work. This is the way Elm works. This is the way that makes the most sense in my mind if you're making a single page web app. And if you follow that, that's how you start to untangle, thinking in terms of states, actions, and rendering. Uh, if you want to try a new thing, if you've heard about a new way to structure your code, a good idea is to start it in a like, little experimental project or a side thing or an internal tool. Don't do it in your main code base where people are going to have to get used to these things that you're introducing. Uh, and finally, if there's abstractions that just add indirection, get rid of them. That's not helpful to anyone. Finally, um, this one was more interesting. We knew that our application had memory problems. AngularJS isn't known for being memory efficient, but ours was like really bad. Uh, it wasn't uncommon to see a tab using almost 400 meg of RAM. Uh, and we started getting reports of iPads crashing and kids being sad in class. And we just felt bad. So we were like, OK, we've got to do something. But how do you find a memory leak? You start searching Stack Overflow, and you're like, uh, I don't know. Like, they have generic tips, but you've got 50,000 lines of code. Where are you going to find it? You're like, oh, I heard event listeners sometimes cause them. Um, you can't just go through and audit 50,000 lines of event listeners. Like, that's not going to happen. So to show you this, I'm going to show you a quick code pen. Um, just a moment. Who would like to guess how much this code pen is using uh, RAM-wise at the moment? Any, any guesses? 100 megabytes? 200? Uh, <laughs> I am, I'm struggling to get my mouse onto this screen. Or oh, is it to the left? Oh, yeah, there we go. I should have mirrored after all. More tools in here. We go to our task manager. Ah, uh, it's opened on my other screen. That is currently using a gigabyte of RAM. Um, so I, I built this today just to demonstrate. Um, the way you measure this is you actually have to learn your tools. You can't find where the memory leak is in a big app just by guessing at, oh, that pattern sometimes causes a leak. And so you come to the Chrome's memory tab. Um, I'm a dedicated Firefox user, but Chrome's really got the best, uh, the best tooling for this. Uh, and we go record allocation timeline. And as we click Start, it will start recording all the memory that's being allocated. And so as I click there, you might see that those blue lines are the memory that, or the lines that come up is the memory that's been allocated, and the bits that go gray are the amount that got freed after we changed our link. Uh, and so if there is an amount, what you would expect is as you change between pages, it should all go gray, and you shouldn't be having any blue bits left in the previous bits. Uh, so I'll pause that now. Um, it will start figuring out our snapshot. Dun, dun, dun. So what I was trying to get at here is that sometimes when you do this stuff, it's not enough to just know what's a good idea. You actually need to learn your tools and learn to deep dive into something. And I felt like it really helped me be a better developer, to be able to come in and go, show me all the memory that was allocated in those two clicks. Um, and 
it goes, there is an array that is taking up 5% uh, of the total memory on the page. And so then I click in, and it comes down, and it goes, ah, oh, it's being held by the page history object, which is collecting all of our stuff. So the page history object has been filling up for hours on end, and now it's using a gigabyte of RAM. Uh, so using your tools is how you get past that. So learning, learning to use your tools. Um, back into it. Uh, some bugs are legitimately hard, so don't just stab in the dark. Learn to do stuff. So in conclusion, how I learned to stop worrying and love the spaghetti, just like this little child. Uh, you can actually enjoy working through code base loads like this. There's a kind of joy that comes through taking something and trying to make it cleaner. We switch from Angular to React, replacing one square at a time. We switch from concatting all of our JavaScript files to using a proper module system like Webpack. We introduced flow for type checking. We added unit tests and end-to-end -end tests. And we started getting there and started being more proud of what was in our code base. Um, and most importantly, we got buy-in from the non-technical founders, the business people in our company. We created a bug score based on the severity of our GitHub issues and made it our kind of key metric that we tried to optimize. And slowly, we started to win. Spaghetti code, it can make you feel dumb when you're sitting there trying to build a simple feature, and it just gets harder and harder. But it's actually a sign that you're getting smarter, not dumber. That when you can recognize the mess in the code, it's a sign that you're maturing as a developer and that you can recognize mistakes that it might have been a mistake you made, it might have been a mistake you inherited. Uh, but it's a sign that you're beginning to see that there's a better way to do things. Uh, and when you see it and start to improve it, it means you're growing, which I think is the most important thing. So I no longer work at that company. Um, in fact, neither does my friend Stephen, the one other developer that was there. We both work at CultureAmp now. Um, and, you know, I, I am allowed to say this, I hope. I hope my boss doesn't get angry. He's sitting over there. Uh, but we have technical debt due. Not every part of our code base is easy to follow and beautifully clean. Uh, but as a company and as a group of developers, we take pride in our code. We focus on writing tests and having type checking. We use things like Elm to try and force us to do things the right way. And we help each other write better code so that the people who come after us and join the team in future have a better experience than I did. Um, so I'm pretty happy with that, and I'm glad to have gone through the experience. I don't regret having worked there, and I feel like the experience of getting in the spaghetti and trying to pull it apart uh, made me a better developer. So thank you.